Hello and welcome to our special event here. Welcome from Montreal, from Frankfurt, uh, from Toronto, from Berlin. Um, welcome everybody on this Friday evening here in Berlin, in Frankfurt, Friday afternoon in Canada. I have to um, check everything is working. I'm your host, Baruch Gottlieb. I'm the curator of the show, uh, which is now uh, on display, but unfortunately not visible uh, directly due to the uh, global health uh, situation. Uh, the show is called Feedback, uh, and this is edition number five, Feedback number five, Global Warning, Marshall McLuhan and the Arts. And uh, we have uh, with us a special, well, we have an event that was uh, supposed to take place in Frankfurt, of course, uh, now, which is becoming quite common. Uh, we're all meeting in uh, this virtual space. Um, and uh, uh, it, it allows us a special uh, perk in this case, because we get to visit with our special guest, Andrew McLuhan, directly from the scriptorum, from the library of Eric McLuhan, uh, in Prince Edward County, Ontario. So we get this special insight and view of, uh, of a very important uh, place of uh, Andrew's work. And I'll be introducing Andrew uh, in a moment. So um, this, again, so this uh, event is in principle coming to you from the Museum of, for Communications in Frankfurt. We have here also uh, in the chat, uh, Tina Novak, who is the curator uh, on the side of the the Museum for Communications, taking care of all the communication, also being my co-pilot here on the stream. Thank you, Tina, for being there. Tina was instrumental in putting together just a beautiful show, which I hope you all get a chance to see at one point, um, integrating uh, elements from the uh, museum's collection into uh, the normal feedback um, traveling collection. Uh, we also have, and this is how uh, this event's going to work. We're going. To, uh, I'll do this small introduction, and then we're uh, going to um, hear uh, Andrew make some remarks and uh, introduce us to to the collection, to to Marshall McLuhan's books, and to uh, Eric McLuhan's books, and the library, and the scriptorum, and his work over there. And then we have our little inner circle here of of uh, guests. I tried to make it so that it would be a little bit like we were meeting in the in the museum with real, you know, uh, uh, people interested in McLuhan who could respond directly. So there's a little bit of a mini audience in front of the greater audience of everybody there. Oh, I see also that another guest has come, fantastic. Okay, so I'll just quickly introduce uh, the people who you might see in the pictures, the little pictures on the side or on top. Uh, we have uh, Angela Crevani who actually came to us in the uh, Museum of Communication to have a talk with Holger Follan from the, uh, the uh, Frankfurt Book Fair. We had a talk about the future of the book and that was really wonderful. And, and Angela is a professor of media theory um, at the U University of Marburg. We also have a colleague or at least uh, uh, working at the same museum and somebody who we also wanted to in invite to the Museum of Communications to talk with, Martin Küsta, also from the uh, uh, Uni University of Marburg, and he's from the Department of English, which actually um, makes a lot of sense. Uh, you, you often find a lot of interesting media thinkers working in language departments, as is the case with uh, uh, another guest here, uh, Jean-Claude, uh, uh, sorry, Jean-Francois Vallée. I almost, uh, I was looking for uh, Jean-Claude Vallée and I, I couldn't find it. Of course, it was Jean-Francois Vallée uh, from uh, uh, Collège Maisonneuve in, in Montreal. He's in the French department of uh, Collège Maisonneuve, and uh, he's um, also very much involved in this realm of media thinking, in particular to uh, North America, especially uh, called media ecology, which is that, that very nice concept which emerges from, from McLuhan's thinking, where it's not merely media, uh, media theory, but media ecology, you have a sense that uh, that there is a there's a whole um, ecosystem of of uh, uh, environmental effects that are, are occurring with the media, and then uh, McLuhan has this wonderful phrase, uh, or at, like a um, exhortation, where he's advising us to search out to find a reasonable ecology among the media. 
uh, and the ecology is like that each media has their own ecosystem and they have to talk to each other somehow. We have to figure out this ecology is very um, interesting, provocative uh, prescription. So welcome uh, Jean-Claude Valley, uh, Jean-François Valley, sorry. Uh, Gislaine Thibault is also joining us from Montreal. So these are two uh, very important uh, uh, participants and, uh, and, um, and team members in preparing our Montreal version of this uh, feedback exhibition which, and, and symposium series, colloquium series, which is actually going to Montreal next. Um, and we also have um, Andrea Bergna. Andrea Bergna is, uh, is um, from the uh, Embassy of Canada in, uh, in Berlin and has been probably the most important caretaker of the uh, McLuhan section, the McLuhan archive in the Marshall McLuhan Salon in uh, Berlin. And actually uh, this year, 2021, if we get to celebrate some things this year, at least we get to celebrate uh, the fact that uh, we started working together in 2021. This year is the centi decennial of um, Marshall McLuhan's birth. So he would have been 110 years old this year. Uh, in uh, 2011, we had, and not only in Berlin, but all over the place in the world, uh, we had a celebration. We had a celebration. We had a large uh, symposium in Berlin for the centennial of, of Marshall McLuhan called Remediating McLuhan. And Andrea Bergner was key to that, um, that enterprise on behalf of the um, Embassy of Canada in Berlin. So we're very, very happy to have Andrea here. Andrea is not only, you know, just representing the embassy again, she's definitely one, uh, somebody who really knows uh, the McLuhan archive and McLuhan's work well, uh, which is very, very unusual, as you see. And we also have Steffi Winkler, who is a, a media uh, theorist and a media uh, scholar from uh, doing her doctorate at the University of the Freie uh, Universität in Berlin. She has also been a very strong partner for me uh, in many, many different ways. And uh, we, of course, uh, worked very, very intensively on this series called McLuminations, which uh, we were able to perform often at the um, at the embassy in the McLuhan Salon. So that goes for the introduction to our uh, assembled uh, panel of experts. And I hope you'll all be taking notes and, uh, and getting ready uh, to have uh, exciting and interesting stimulating questions, get the best out of this precious opportunity with Andrew. And without further ado, I'd like to uh, introduce our guest of honor today, Andrew McLuhan, who's joining us from the scriptorum in Prince Edward County, Ontario. Uh, it's uh, it's really a pleasure and a joy for us to for, for us to welcome you here, Andrew. Um, please uh, take over the floor and let us know where you are. What is this place, and uh, what do you want to tell us today about uh, Marshall McLuhan's reading habits, and also maybe some of those of his uh, very important collaborator, his son and your father, Eric McLuhan. Welcome, Andrew McLuhan. Thank you, thank you, Baruch. Um, thank you so much, and to Tina uh, for for the invitation to to be here, there, everywhere today. Um, thank you to the the Museum for Communication in Frankfurt. Uh, it is too bad I couldn't be there, um, but uh, the consolation prize is that I get to be here, and I get to bring you all here as well. Um, here is uh, my father's library, which uh, Baruch called the scriptorium, which is what he called it. Uh, a scriptorium was the name of the, the room where monks would illuminate their manuscripts. Um, so that's, uh, that's what we call this place. It's a, a two-story barn in rural Ontario, a couple hours east of Toronto and a few more hours uh, west of Montreal. Uh, hello to my Montreal friends. Um, and uh, this houses my father's um, book collection, uh, about 6,000 volumes, uh, and also what, what we have of our McLuhan archives, which is um, a lot of things of Marshall's, pretty much most things that aren't in the National Archive in Toronto or the Fisher Library, sorry, Fisher Library in Toronto or National Archive in Ottawa are here um, in, in the scriptorium. So it's, um, it's a wonderful, kind of magical place, this, this library kind of museum. Um, this is where in 2009, 10, and 11, 
I did the initial work of inventorying um, and documenting Marsha McLuhan's library, which is the reason that we're here today. Um, I'm, I'm really pleased that I'm part of the, the fifth feedback. Um, when, when you think of the number five in McLuhan work, you think of rhetoric and the parts of rhetoric. And what's kind of funny is there's a little note here. It says rhetoric um, because these are my father's rhetoric reference uh, books, his rhetoric shelf. So that's kind of fun. Um, here on my right are our McLuhan shelves. There's a collection of Marshall McLuhan's works, first editions, manuscripts. Um, up top, you can't see it, but um, his typescript for his thesis on Thomas Nash and the Trivium is here um, that, that make up this, this collection, this library, which um, there's, there's so many ways to come into talking about this collection, about talking about Marshall McLuhan's books. Um, this is actually, I think, the seventh time I've done it. Uh, the first time was in 2011 in Brazil, um, and I've spoken about it at the Fisher Archive in Toronto um, twice, actually. A couple of years ago, Marshall McLuhan's collection, collected library in Toronto was named to the UNESCO Memory of the World Registry. Um, they marked it as a globally significant cultural artifact. Um, where I'm talking to you from today, from Eric McLuhan's library, it's very much an extension and outgrowth of Marshall's library. Um, their methods, which I'll, I'll talk about in, in using their books, are very similar, of course, um, father and son being teacher and student to an extent. Um, some of the things I'd like to talk about today are uh, books themselves as an agent of change, um, not merely because of the content, because of what's in them, of course, but also because of the form and what this, this structure of a book allows us to do. Um, books as uh, a very sophisticated technology, which is easy to lose in this conversation uh, the conversations we have today about electronic and digital communication devices. Uh, it's kind of fun that um, thinking about the Museum of Communication in Germany, uh, which was originally the Postal Museum, I'm told, which, which is great, um, had me thinking about this library uh, and my grandfather's library as uh, a communication artifact. Uh, and there's a lot to be spoken of there libraries as agents of change. Um, I wanted to, to open with um, a McLuhan quote from this book, Theories of Communication, um, which my father edited together in 2011. Um, and the introduction opens with Eric saying, a fundamental principle of this book is that communication entails change. The sine qua non of communication therefore is the matter of effect. If there's no effect, if there's no change in the audience, there's no communication. The approach is rhetoric to the core. Um, so this idea of communication and change and transformation. Um, Marshall's library was very much an agent of change in my life. Uh, the process of documenting and inventorying it um, and everything that came out of it was uh, a lot more potent and forming than, than I thought it would be. You know, I set out to, to catalog a bunch of books to see what's in 200 boxes. Um, and I discovered a lot more than just uh, titles and publishing data. Um, I thought about these collections as intergenerational communications devices. And if you'll forgive me for a cumbersome phrase I think it speaks a lot. Um, this is one of the main things uh, about these collections that I wasn't expecting was how much of my father and grandfather are within these books that they used, um, how much of themselves they left behind in them. Um, just a note on the slides, I can't see them, but um, they're going by, I assume. Um, they're a collection of images from uh, the last 10 plus 10 years or so. Um, and there's a, a lot of the photographs are of books that I documented and inventoried um, of marginalia, Marshall's notes. 
um, the things inside the books. Uh, there's a picture of me at my desk just over here, which is where I did all the work. Um, pictures from around the scriptorium, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Pictures of Marshall and Eric. Um, they're, they're just meant for a bit of visual reference. It's not synchronous to what I'm speaking about, um, but um, as I talk, it'll sort of uh, illustrate or describe um, the slides. Um, the two libraries, Marshall and Eric's libraries, have a lot in common, um, but they're also very different now. And that's because um, Marshall's library, which is now at the Fisher Rare Book Library at the University of Toronto, um, it's very well cared for. Um, if it couldn't be here, that's the next best place. Part of the reason for that is because Fisher is you don't have to be a student to access the collection um, in non-pandemic lock time, lockdown times. Anybody can go to the Fisher Library um, and look at their list and say, oh, may I see Marshall's, well, this copy of Finnegan's Wake of Marshall's because he had half a dozen or so. Um, and they'll bring it up to you and you can look through it. And that's, um, that's very important to me uh, because well, I have access, I guess, either way, but um, a lot of uh, the interest in McLuhan studies comes from outside of academia. Uh, and it's important to me that um, people outside of academia have, have the same kind of access as academics do. Um, it's a little harder to access the collections at the National Archives in Ottawa. I actually have never been there myself. Um, the other thing about uh, the books at Fisher is um, the way that they process the books. So uh, the books here um, have a lot of things interleaved into them. Um, Marshall's habit was to uh, say if there was a book review in the New York Times, he would clip it out and put it with the relevant book. Um, if there was you know, anything else that might uh, capture or see a correlation, he would put in there extra pages of notes. If he ran out of uh, margin space or end papers, he would write on another piece of paper and slip it into the book. Um, the way they process uh, an artifact like a single book at Fisher, and I think most libraries of that nature, is they remove these pieces from it and make a note of where it was in the book. But you end up with a book and a file of things that were once in the book. Um, so to an extent, you're, you're changing the collection and the nature of it. Um, you, when you get a book from Fisher, they bring the other materials to you. So they're all there, but it's the nature of it has changed. Um, also, the books are downstairs um, in the massive storage facility below and in these shelves that all kind of lock together. Um, you know, with the other half a million books that they have at Fisher. So um, it's, a, it's a change to the nature of the library and to the books themselves. Um, the advantage of this library here is that it's all still together. Um, the books are st still on the shelves in the relation uh, that Eric put them to. Uh, and the books, it's kind of interesting, uh, and forgive me if some of what I, I talk about station with each other, you know, it really feels that way. Um, there's, a, there's a magic to a library um, as a whole. Uh, it seems to serve things up to you. Um, and it's, uh, it's the kind of place, this one especially, where um, you better have some time on your hands because if you come in and you take a book off the shelves and you open it and you look at it, all of a sudden it's two hours later or you know a day later. Um, one of the the most surprising things you'll learn about uh, a library like this, an annotated library, a working library, is that um, you know you might think if you don't think too hard about it that a book has a sort of a shelf life, <laughs> if you will, um, that uh, a writer writes a book the book goes to the publisher, it becomes published and ends up in bookshelves. Um, somebody buys it, reads it, then it sits on the shelf. But um, in McLuhan work, that's, that's the beginning of the story. Um, to back up a little bit, 
uh, as, as we mentioned before, and I know there are some English people in the audience, Marshall was an English professor uh, for his entire career. Uh, he studied English at university um, in Canada and then at Cambridge University in the UK. Uh, he was an expert in modernist poetry. Um, but for his entire career, even while he got into media studies, he was still an English professor and taught English professionally um, for most of his career at the University of Toronto. But this is all to say that um, books were his business. Uh, there are quite a few pictures in the slideshow of, of Marshall in his library. Um, one of them is, uh, is the, this book here. This is a great advantage of being here is I can pull up exhibits here. This is Marshall in his library at the Center for Culture and Technology. Um, and he always had a couch or a chaise or, or somewhere to lie down because he liked to get off his feet um, and, and get a little bit horizontal. It takes the pressure off the feet and off the mind and allows for, let's say, lateral thinking. So there's, there's Marshall and what his library would look like. Uh, I came across a note um, from my grandmother uh, talking about how uh, Marshall spent most of his time, a lot of his time reading um, and his library is evidence of that. Um, his library is a collection which spans around 50 years. Um, he brought a lot of books back from Cambridge um, and he collected books all throughout. Um, when I started uh, my catalog in around two, winter of 2009, um, the reason I was doing it was uh, my father had inherited the books um, after Marshall died and uh, he used them, but not all of them. And he had decided that the it was time for the books to move on. Um, most of the collection was sitting in around 200 boxes in the big barn, safe, but not in the great, the greatest conditions uh, for storage. But before the books could go anywhere, and it wasn't certain that it would be Fisher, um, we had to have an idea of what was there. So um, my dad had managed to find a small grant to help pay for my time, and I spent uh, <laughs> the better part of two years um, inventorying uh, this library. And um, what I was originally doing was just marking the publication data, the name of the book, so the title, the author, the edition, where it was published, the condition of the book. Um, but I already knew at this point that much of the value in the collection was in the annotation, so what Marshall added to these books. Um, so I made a note of uh, whether there was annotation present and to what degree if there were other things included. It became quickly clear that most of the books um, were used uh, by Marshall and, and bore the marks of his use. Um, he didn't really keep many books around that weren't useful. Um, I mean, there's only a, a, certain, a, a limited amount of shelf space for one thing. So, But it was also a working library. And it's this notion of um, a working library that's, that's important here. Um, Marshall, uh, a lot of Marshall's work um, was built off the work of others. Um, famously, people like Harold Innes uh, and then people like James Joyce. Um, they're both equally important to Marshall's work. In fact, Marshall uh, quotes James Joyce in Finnegan's Wake a lot more than he ever quotes uh, Harold Innes uh, or anyone else. I think it's probably Joyce and Finnegan's Wake first, and then maybe followed by the Bible and or Shakespeare. Uh, but Joyce is, is very present um, on the literary side of things. Um, the way that Marshall worked was he would read these books and he would read something and it would spark another thought and he'd make a note in the margin and then he would make a note in the four end papers um, so that he could refer to it later. Um, there, there are a few uh, interesting features of the library itself. For one, uh, the books. Um, when he acquired a book, he most often wrote his name and the date and place of acquisition. Um, so as you'll see in the slides, um, it'll say H.M. McLuhan, Trinity Hall, Cambridge, 1936, or 33 or 34. 
um, or it will say Marshall McLuhan University of Toronto. Um, an interesting thing, uh, in a way we can date things, um, because as I said, the collection spans around 50 years, is um, it, the quality of Marshall's handwriting changes over the years. In his early years, in the uh, 30s and 40s, he had a very flowing student's copper plate uh, script. Um, as the years go on, it becomes a little more disjointed. Um, he reverts more and more to short forms of words, um, M slash M for the medium is the message, uh, EOM for extensions of man, um, things of this nature. Um, so when you're looking at an annotation, you can, you can date it, if only roughly, uh, depending on um, the legibility or you know, the style of the script. Um, and this is useful because Marshall was not somebody who read a book once and put it back on the shelf. Um, like most tools, if they're useful once, they're useful again. And many of Marshall's books uh, show that he referred to them um, over and over. So it's interesting, you can, you can look at a volume and see um, notes that were put there in the 30s or 40s and more notes that were added later and you can tell by the quality of the handwriting. So that's very interesting. And um, I've noticed myself, one of the books I concentrate on is Understanding Media. And every time I read it, I get more from it. You know, um, you might think that the content of the book remains the same over the years, but um, you change. Uh, and so the content means something different to you as well. Uh, I know in my own mind, when I read Understanding Media at age 16, it meant very little to me. Uh, when I read it in my 20s, it meant a little more. In my 30s, more still. And when I just uh, reread it in the fall, um, I got a whole lot more out of it. Um, so Marshall revisited these works and the quality of his interaction changes. Um, the things which jump out at him and have meaning to him change. Um, so uh, it's very interesting that um, by his name and date and location, um, we're able to track his movements a little bit. But um, by the changing annotation uh, and what jumps out at him, we're able to track his intellectual development and movements to an extent. And that's kind of an interesting thing. Um, I can't help but think about um, what an artifact like this means today to scholarship. Um, you know, when we're all really dependent on our, our laptops and devices and so much of what we consume is as a PDF, um, how a collection like this takes on a whole, whole new meaning and um, the quality of your engagement with your library, with your texts, is necessarily going to be much different. Um, so uh, things like Marshall's library and a library like this have a, have a very different meaning now, obviously. Um, other, other, collect, other books in Marshall's collection are presentation copies, and I have uh, several photos of them, um, books that were given to him by people like Ezra Pound, uh, Wyndham Lewis, quite a few Lewis uh, books, of course, um, and various other people over the years. Uh, it was a really, doing the inventory uh, in 2009, 10, 11, was, uh, it was thrilling. It was exciting. Um, I was sitting here at my desk and I'd go out to the barn and I'd bring a box in and you don't know what's in the box. Uh, it was very, uh, Tina and I were talking a little bit about this before, uh, this excitement of, uh, of archiving, and maybe it's a really geeky thing, but um, these books are like, tr uh, boxes are like treasure chests. You don't know what's going to be in them. Um, and, you know, it could be not that impressive, but uh, so my desk is over here and my father's desk is over there. And when I would open a new box, uh, my dad would come over to see because he hadn't looked in them for years. Um, he had a lot of the books, uh, the main books on his shelves uh, because he used them as well. But um, so he would wander over and we'd, we'd pull them out and have a look. And sometimes we'd find very surprising things. Um, if you're interested in following 
Um, while I did this uh, inventory, I kept a blog called Inscriptorium, one word, uh, inscriptorium.wordpress.com. Um, and that has uh, a lot of the uh, things that I discovered along the way, such as um, one day I, I opened a box and I pulled out this book of uh, Ezra Pound in the Cantos. Uh, and it was a nice old hardcover book and I opened it up and inside was a, a typewritten letter from Ezra Pound to Marshall McLuhan uh, that you know few people had ever seen before. Uh, a lot of the correspondence from Pound to McLuhan and back is in the letters of Marshall McLuhan book, but um, this is one that had never seen been seen before. And um, you know, I even get a little tingly thinking about it now, discovering something like this. Um, uh, this is one of the ones I documented on Inscriptorium and. Um, Pound is very brusque in saying, uh, McLuhan, get on with the job. Uh, it's, it's a funny thing. Um, another really interesting one I found was, um, while I was doing this inventory, I was also fact checking um, our bibliography of Marsha McLuhan's works, um, which was started years and years and years ago. And my father cobbled together into one document um, and just to make sure we had page numbers and uh, other things right, when I came across something of Marshall's, I would make, uh, I would check the bibliography and make sure I had things. So I pulled out this book called From Source to Sat Statement by McCrimmon, um, and it's a collection of essays along uh, communication, communication theory, uh, and it included a reprint of The Medium is the Message. So um, I flipped ahead to make sure we had the page range right. And here was a handwritten note by Marshall saying, I first used this phrase in May 1959, or June, as he said, um, at a radio broadcasters conference in BC. Uh, I wanted to reassure them that TV could not end radio. And this kind of started uh, another main quest of mine um, around the medium is the message where uh, I'm trying to collect um, every, uh, example of Marshall using that phrase uh, and I'm assembling them across a timeline so that um, instead of you having to go to Wikipedia to get some questionably explained answer of what that means, uh, you can go to the timeline and see these hundreds of examples of Marshall using the phrase in different ways. So um, I have actually managed to track down the first usage uh, and it was at a radio broadcasters conference in uh, British Columbia at UBC uh, in 1958, uh, in May 1958. And I have a transcript uh, and there in the transcript, a couple pages in Marshall first says the medium is the message. And that's pretty exciting. Uh, a really interesting note and related to Museum for Communication uh, and Media Ecology is that um, Marshall said uh, a few places that at the moment of Sputnik, uh, ecological thinking became inevitable. Um, and he's talking about the satellite Sputnik, which went up in, uh, was it September or October, 1957. Uh, six months later, Marshall made an ecological statement that the medium is the message. Uh, so that's an interesting uh, confluence. Um, I'm not sure how much we've got a bit of time left. Um, there's so much we could we could talk about with these books. Uh, if you if you have specific questions, maybe I can show you um, some of these books. So, for example, um, here are three copies of Understanding Media, uh, which are still here. Thankfully, this one is uh, a presentation copy leather bound from the, uh, from the publisher. Uh, and there's a congratulatory note uh, in it from McGraw Hill to Marsha McLuhan. This was a Christmas present. Um, these three books are, are very interesting because um, understanding media uh, is, is part of kind of a trilogy. This was published in 1964 and um, this is the first edition here. Uh, but it grew out of an earlier work. Uh, Marshall was commissioned uh, to, by the National Association of Educational Broadcasters in Washington, DC to prepare a, a high school curriculum 
on understanding media. Um, he delivered a report, which is called the Report on the Project in Understanding New Media. Um, and it reads very much like, um, you know, a work of scholarship in a report, a bureaucratic type thing. He spent the next four years rewriting it and revising it, jargon and scholastic stuff work we have today, so that it was published as Understanding Media in 1964. Um, a few years later, uh, around 1970, uh, Marshall was approached by the publisher um, to do a 10th anniversary edition. Uh, so the publisher said, you know, you can write a new introduction. Um, Marshall uh, thought this was a great opportunity to address uh, some of the criticisms that understanding media had faced. Um, and uh, as I say, they came in sort of two kinds, um, uh, ad addressing errors of, of fact or you know mistakes that Marshall made, typos, that sort of thing. Um, and then another major category of criticism was that it wasn't scientific. So um, Marshall and my father, Eric, uh, was working with him by this time. Uh, Eric joined Marshall in the mid, late 60s. Uh, and worked with him uh, until Marshall died um, in 1980, December 31st. We just passed the 40th anniversary of Marshall's death. Um, and then Eric kept going on after Marshall died. But the, um, the 10th anniversary edition, uh, they called UMR, or Understanding Media Revised. Um, UMR is their short form designation. And these are all part of UMR. So. Um, as I said, they wanted to address this idea of it not being scientific. So um, they uh, decided to see whether you could come up with any scientific statements about media or the study of media or communication. Um, and uh, that was a completely different term from what the publisher wanted. Uh, and it became a separate book, which was published eventually as Laws of Media, The New Science in 1988 by Eric. Um, long story short, the, uh, what they found was that all media do have some things in common. There are some laws of media, uh, things that you can say about all technologies, um, and you can say a lot about a lot of technologies, but all, four manif all tech manifests these four uh, common attributes, which is that they enhance a function they obsolesce or take over from or push aside another. They retrieve something from the past. And when you push a technology far enough, it flips or reverses its characteristics. And these four things became what was what's called the tetrad of, of media laws. Um, these different books. Uh, so this one here, for example, um, this is actually Corinne's copy, Marshall's wife, <laughs> which Marshall appropriated to make notes in, uh, and he inscribed it to her for an extension of me that can never be loved or thanked as she deserves from her proud husband, Marshall McLuhan. Uh, and on the inside, okay, so the first annotation there is understanding is not a point of view. Um, I guess maybe it's on the uh, first page of the other one. It says uh, that um, these are all for UMR. But basically what Marshall and Eric did was um, they took uh, these copies of the books and this one was Marshall's and the black jacket here was Eric's copy. And they all, uh, they went through them and made notes toward UMR, toward Understanding Media Revised. Um, and the, the idea was first to maybe add some more chapters, um, but it quickly grew into to this other project. Um, so here's an example in there. You have uh, a whole bunch of, of general notes about that chapter. Um, these are in Marshall's handwriting. And then as you go along through the pages, uh, there are more. Um, Let's see if there's the example of a margin note. Um, and then they're, they're indexed at the back. So this is what uh, the back index looks like. Um, 
So anyway, that's just to give you uh, a bit of a look at, at what the uh, an individual work looks like. Um, some of the books in the library are more or less heavily annotated. Uh, I had mentioned uh, the Finnegan's Wake books before. Um, Marshall, that book was so important to Marshall. He got so much out of it that um, he had half a dozen copies. And the reason for that is uh, he'd fill one copy with notes and have to get a new copy in order to make more notes. Um, as a gift, uh, Father John Culkin uh, had a, a copy of Finnegan's Wake specially bound into three leather volumes with blank pages set in between each regular page. Uh, and the funny thing about that is that um, it was such a beautiful gift that Marshall never made any notes in it. He just kept it. Um, but just to, to sum up a little bit, since we're coming near the, the question time, the really interesting thing about uh, Marshall's books and Eric's books in these libraries is that they turn a book from what you might think of as a one-way communication device into a two-way or even multiple way when I think of myself in relation to this, because um, I've now started documenting and inventorying Eric's books. Uh, and it's a really a w a kind of a strange thing to, to follow my dad's footsteps and see uh, my dad bought this in Dallas in the 80s when he was studying there, or um, I found a book that he, uh, you know, inscribed to me for my birthday um, in a time in the early 2000s when we were a little tense with each other and I wasn't talking to him. And so, but I found it on the bookshelf, you know, um, there's a, there's a, the book has a lot more life than you might imagine. Uh, and you think of them as these static and kind of sterile things. Um, and it's really, I don't know if I'm able to give you a sense coming through a uh, fiber optic like this, but there's a feel and a vibe and a vitality to them. Um, I almost see the annotation, the ink, um, almost as blood uh, vitalizing, adding life uh, to these books and bringing them alive. Um, it really does feel uh, like there's a lot of Marshall and Eric here and there's a lot of, of Marshall's things in this building. So, um, you know, it is kind of the two of them. Uh, and the library as, as a total artifact um, is a very interesting thing because it seems to serve things up um, just when you, you want them. Um, for example, Brooke and I were talking yesterday uh, about explorations um, and the Explorations magazine, which was uh, co-edited by Marshall McLuhan and Edmund Carpenter, uh, ran through the first nine issues uh, and then continued as an insert in um, the Varsity Graduate magazine. Um, this is it here, this little magazine. And uh, the first nine issues um, are a lot more, uh, more well-known uh, than these, which um, exist as these little pamphlets inside um, University of Toronto Varsity magazine. Uh, and I found um, after the first nine uh, issues of Explorations, there were another uh, 20 or so. Um, it ended up being 32 issues. This is the final um, Varsity graduate magazine that has Explorations in it. And at the very end, uh, let's see here. It's actually interesting because these are all about um, reading. Um, but at the very end, there's an editor's note at the bottom here. And it says, Mr. Ken Eady, who I think is the uh, editor of Varsity Graduate, tells me that in all the years that Exploration Series has appeared in The Graduate, there has never been a response, pro or con, nor a comment of any sort. Uh, which is very interesting because um, the Explorations magazine, the Independent, um, was very influential and it's, they sold out almost immediately. Um, and there's an enduring interest in it. Um, but this continuation, which um, was handled more by Marshall, Carpenter was not editor, although a few of his pieces uh, appear here and there in the further volumes. Uh, it was Marshall's thing, and you wonder um, if it was because Carpenter wasn't involved that it wasn't as popular, or because it was in the Varsity Mag, maybe it didn't have the same reach. Um, 
in any case, uh, I'm very grateful for this opportunity to speak uh, from here because uh, to show you the, the vitality of this collection, um, which I'm now going to somewhat regard as a, a museum of communication. Uh, and my father and grandfather being kind of the, the muse in, in the museum. Um, so if you have questions about specific books or annotations or, or anything else, I'm happy to attempt to answer them. Uh, and thank you very much for, for your attention today. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you so much. Um, I'm trying to switch back to the group view. Uh, thank you so much, Thank Andrew. you for that the was... silent clap. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, I mean, it's, it's, uh, that is always lacking at the end of these presentations, the warmth of the applause, but uh, I try to accommodate with my, my golden tones here. Thank um, you. <laughs> Uh, yeah, just a, a precious insight into uh, this so wonderful um, uh, treasure tre treasure chest of um, of stimulating uh, references and uh, and also personal history. And you're so generous with it, and uh, that always that really did touch me at the first time when I uh, I discovered uh, you as a media thinker, which was at the uh, Minnie McLuhan's conference when when the UNESCO um, um, what is it called? Treasures of the world, or um, the memory of the world. Memory of the world uh, uh, co was collecting uh, the McLuhan uh, Library for the, the Fisher, uh, which ends up now in a very nice presentation uh, uh, curated by John Schusnith at the uh, at the Fisher Rare Books Library at the University of Toronto. Um, and yeah, your presentation was so. Um, you know, it was very insightful and, and uh, critical, uh, but also very intimate and very generous. And that's something that, you know, you really, uh, you don't get uh, a lot in, uh, in academic <laughs> circles. So it was very beautiful and refreshing. And uh, again, um, you, um, you brought us in. And um, I guess uh, for, uh, for a first uh, couple, I mean, I have a couple of questions to lead off. I mean, we, we're speaking about explorations, which is one of the uh, major projects which is on display at the, at the uh, Museum of Communications in Frankfurt as part of the feedback series. But there's another one there which, in which uh, your father, Eric, was intimately involved and centrally involved, and that is the, uh, the Dewline newsletter. You have, some, um, you have some elements there. Maybe you can, uh, you can pull out uh, a couple of uh, things from the, from the stacks and uh, introduce us a little bit to also like what, I mean, I know that Eric was like shuttling between Toronto and New York, between Marshall McLuhan and Gene Schwartz in, uh, how did that all work? And uh, I, I think you have some nice little elements there to share with us. Yeah, um, I love doing the show and tell thing. <laughs> uh, on the McLuhan Institute YouTube page, um, I do, uh, I, it's been suspended for a little while while I was teaching, but I try to do a, a live thing at 9 p.m. Eastern every Tuesday night, where um, as I'm doing Mark, Eric's inventory, um, I show what I'm doing. So there are over 50 episodes now, and one of them is on the Do, Do Line newsletter. Um, I talk about all kinds of things I'm coming across and trying to share what little knowledge I've been able to pick up over the years. Um, the Do Line newsletter is a very interesting thing. Um, it came about following Marsha McLuhan's uh, time at Fordham University in New York City uh, in the 1967-68 uh, academic year. Um, Marsha made a lot of connections in New York. Actually, there's a lot to say about McLuhan in New York. Um, McLuhan as the pop icon kind of kicked off in New York City with Tom Wolfe and, and other people uh, and continued on. And, um, Marshall became acquainted with Eugene Schwartz uh, and this thing called the Human Development Corporation. And they decided to do a newsletter. And the, the concept for the newsletter was, um, it's kind of a proto blog. It's supposed to be um, hot off McLuhan's brain insight, uh, specifically directed toward business people. Uh, and that was one of Marshall's main markets at the time was business, um, advertising, marketing, those kind of people. Um, so the McLuhan Dew Line newsletter was born and uh, Marshall used this metaphor of the Dew Line uh, quite a lot. Uh, it's this array of satellite um, 
systems across the north of Canada that were supposed to warn of oncoming Russian assault, uh, supposed to warn the US. Uh, Marshall saw uh, a lot of his work as a kind of dew line. He's trying to warn us of what's on our cultural and technological horizons, uh, on our cultural horizon from the technological coming over. Um, and he talks a lot about the artist as Duline, the artist as the person that's uh, showing us what's what's coming. Um, so the Duline newsletter ran uh, two volumes. It didn't quite go the full two. Um, it didn't last quite two years. Uh, Eric McLuhan, my father, who went to Fordham with Marshall, um, along with Edmund Carpenter and George Thompson and Harley Parker, um, uh, Eric served as the general editor for the do line. Um, and it was his responsibility uh, not only to edit, um, but also Eric stayed in New York and shuttled back and forth from Toronto. He would go to Toronto and uh, get information from Marshall, um, bring it back and they would assemble it into a newsletter. Um, it, it was never quite hot off the noggin. Um, one of the problems with it was that there was uh, significant delays and backlog and they weren't getting it out as quickly as everybody wanted to. Um, actually, some of the material that ended up in the do line also uh, appears in these um, explorations off prints uh, from the graduate varsity graduate magazine complete. Uh, here's the first. Um, the first one is is very much a uh, newspaper kind of newslettery looking thing. Um, kind of low budget. As it went along, it be, it got a higher and higher production value um, to uh, let's see. Here's one of the one of the cool ones. For example, full color. A lot of them had cutouts. Um, experimental typography, various things. This issue also came with a couple smaller inserts. Um, and this is the edition uh, two, number one, that came with the infamous Dueline card deck. And this was a, a deck of playing cards um, designed by Marshall McLuhan in collaboration with some other people. Um, and it's a, a deck of playing cards um, meant, uh, as Marshall calls it in here, a contemporary I Ching. Uh, and uh, some people might have heard or might know of uh, Brian Eno's Oblique Strategies deck. Um, this predates Oblique Strategies by a few years and served as part of the inspiration for, for Eno and Schmidt and their Oblique Strategies deck. Um, the idea is um, that if you, if you have some kind of writer's block or business block or problem, pull a card or two at random from the deck and see if there's any relation, if you can get any insight. Um, if not, try again. Um, and they're, they're also arranged deliberately. Um, if you set them all out by suit and by number, you'll see there's a relation uh, across the suits. So um, it's, it's not totally random. There, there is deliberation there. Um, so yeah, the Dewline uh, newsletter is a lot of fun and it's great that um, you're able to, to show it to the public. They're, um, although they had a, a sort of high production value, they're, they're flimsy little things. You know, they're, uh, the first one is sort of mimeographed, photocopied, whatever. Um, they're hard to find now because they, you know, they're stapled they don't really survive. Uh, another artifact, which is pretty neat, I don't know what I would ever do with this, but this is the subscription rolls for the Duline newsletter. Um, it's everybody who has uh, ever subscribed to it. Um, and it's uh, around the world, there's thousands and thousands of, of names and, and addresses. Commercial properties, Longwood Drive, Baton Rouge, Baton Rouge Louisiana, New York, New York, Hartford, Connecticut, um, all over, uh, you know, this, this place here is kind of lousy with artifacts. It's like every, everywhere you turn, I even have, um, these are, uh, Eric McLuhan's files, uh, for each of the do line newsletters. Um, so these are all the, the notes and things that went into, uh, the creation of, of each newsletter. There's, uh, uh, so many materials I'm really looking forward to, um, 
the time when I'm able to to invite uh, friends from Montreal or anywhere else to come and visit here. Um, situated as I am in, in Bloomfield, Ontario, kind of equidistant between Toronto and, and Ottawa, uh, it kind of creates a natural stopping point for the really dedicated McLuhan freak to come visit. Uh, and that's that's part of my object with what I call now the McLuhan Institute is um, to be open and available to the public eventually. Um, I'm working, uh, well, I'm raising funds to create a guest suite upstairs um, so that uh, researchers, writers, artists um, can come and experience um, the magic of this space uh, and come and write, research, create um, here. So um, there, the McLuhanInstitute.com is where you'll be able to find all that kind of information when I eventually learn how to program a website. <laughs> Thank you, Andrew. Uh, we have already a question from Jean-François Vanier. Jean Bonjour. Uh, wait, you're you're muted, Jean-François. I have to unmute you. Yeah. But... Oops, sorry. Hold on. Please unmute yourself again. I was too fast. Okay. Yes. You, Thank you. I unmuted and you remuted me. Yes, I know. <laughs> Because <laughs> it's nice to see you, Andrew, even if it's only in, in 2D. Uh, I was lucky enough to, see, to, to visit the archives in, in Ottawa, the, the, the McLuhan Fond there. And I think I was also one of the first to see the, the Fisher uh, collection of uh, Marshall McLuhan's books in the, during the 2011 100th anniversary uh, conference there. I was cool. given a special permission to access some books I wanted to see for my for my research when they were still in, in boxes, I think at that point. And, and I didn't know at that point that you were the one that was that, were, that was ca cataloging those books. Uh, there's two books I was interested in in, in, in in the Marshall McLuhan Library. I'm wondering if they're also in uh, Eric's uh, library that I would like to visit at some point when we're allowed to yeah. see actual people again one day, hopefully. Uh, I will go visit you, I hope. If it's possible at any time if we write in advance to, yeah. to go visit the scriptorium. For sure. Yeah. Well, I'm wondering if Eric had his own copy of Théard de Chardin's uh, The Phénomène Humain, uh, the 1955 book that was published after the death of Théard de Chardin. Do you know if he had his own, his own copy, to, uh, Eric? There's one in I, Marshall's I, collection. Okay. I'm not, I'm not sure. Um, if you want to email me, I'll, I'll take a look later. Um, I, I can't. I haven't got... So in my own inventory... Um, like I said, Eric, Eric's library is very similar in size and scope to Marshall's. Um, so they're both around 6,000 volumes. I'm maybe 10% of the way in my own inventory. And I started over there and I'm here and I still have all the way around to go. So I haven't gotten to Chardin uh, as of yet. Um, but I'll, I'll Mar Marshall's playing. copy is like has interesting annotations. I was wondering if Eric also, if, if he has a, his own copy, if it was annotated too. And Probably. also Lewis Mumford, uh, I guess there's some Lewis yep. Mumford, like Techniques and Civilization. Do, do, do you think there, there's a copy there? Uh, yeah, yeah. Because it, there's also annotations in Marshall's copy in, in, in the Fisher. And I was very curious to learn that you're able to identify just through the writing, the, the period where, where it was written. I, I, might, I might have to email you about this. Uh, sure. I, was, I wasn't sure when the annotations were made in these books. Uh, some of them had the abbreviations, the EOM, and the, uh, but I was wondering from what, what time they were, what time frame. So maybe you could help me with that. I'll write yeah, you an email. Yeah, I mean, you can't, you can't necessarily date it to 1965 or 1953. No. But you can place it, you can place it in decade anyway. Um, and for instance, if, if the writing is similar and you see an annotation for UMR, you know that it's got to be at least 1970, somewhere in the 70s. Um, you know, you can, you can tell depending on what he's actually commenting and how that appears in his work, sort of when it would have been, you know, so, so there are ways to, to identify by its relation to other things, um, just when it might have been. I always find it really interesting to see um, just how, you know, uh, something leaps out at him in, in the 60s or 70s that didn't occur to him in the 50s. Uh, you know, for example, with this, this talk about Sputnik, 
um, at the moment of Sputnik, you know, um, that was something Marshall wrote in the 60s, well after the event in 1957. So, you know, uh, it took him quite a while before he realized that that was actually this turning point. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. The end of nature. Um, but please, uh, Jean-Francois, <laughs> do email me um, and I'll, I'll have a look yeah. for the, the Mumford and the, the Teilhard de Chardin for you. Does Eric, does your father use the same technique as uh, his father with the index at the, in the back too, yeah? Does. Yeah, exactly the same. Thank you. Yes, the planet became enclosed in a man-made environment and became an artwork. Uh, the result <laughs> okay. of, uh, of Sputnik. We have a couple of questions from the uh, YouTube -itariat, Um here. We have a question from Alex uh, uh, Ternovetsky. Uh, oh. He asked if, do you know this person? Um, hey, Alex. Uh, he asks, is there, have you found any I Ching in actual I Ching in the library or any other Taoist texts? Um, there is a copy of the I Ching uh, in Eric's library. Um, in Marshall's library, there was even a, a book on the tarot um, that had a few notes in it. Um, they aren't, they aren't heavily annotated. Uh, Marshall and Eric's interests, um, I mean, there was really no taboo subject. Um, you know, these are guys that dealt in metaphor. So even if it wasn't so much interesting, literally, it was at least interesting metaphorically. Uh, and they basically took metaphor and, and ran with it and used it for all it's worth. Um, but um, there isn't, uh, there isn't a huge representation of Eastern thought um, in their libraries. Most of um, what, actually that's not true. Marshall was very interested in the Japanese concept of ma, uh, or, which relates to acoustic, acoustic space. Um, and there's some, some writing that he did on that, uh, acoustic and visual space being a very um, hot topic uh, Marshall, of course. Yes, acoustic Thanks, space. We are uh, yeah. we are deep in acoustic space. I see. Right now, I'm trying to. We're on the acoustic for... spaceship. <laughs> that is the echo of ecology. Um, we have some. Um, <laughs> we have some more questions. I think. Um, uh, Gislaine, do, would you like to ask a question? Sure. Um, thank you, Andrew, for this fascinating tour. Uh, I was curious, you said it's filled with artifacts and I wanted to know what do you make of media that are not written documents or books? Um, so in your presentation, you had a deck of cards. Uh, so what do you make of photographs and of games or did you find coupons or receipts that are um, worth, uh, that have some sort of significance? Definitely. Um, the, the tricky thing uh, with collections is what to keep, or maybe more importantly, what not to keep. I tend to err on the side of keeping everything <laughs> uh, because you never know um, what could be interesting and important. And, um, you know, even things like receipts uh, boarding passes for flights, um, they all tell part of the story. Um, of course, my wife, it drives her a little bit crazy because uh, it borders, you know, uh, archivists are just hoarders with an excuse, you know. <laughs> um, you try not to, to let it get out of hand, but, um, you know, a barn uh, is kind of, you know, they say that a goldfish will grow to the size of its bowl, well, a, a barn will fill, you know, and fill and fill and fill. So you have to be careful, but um, I, when my, my grandmother, uh, my grandmother passed and her house, number three, Witchwood Park in Toronto was sold. This was the McLuhan house for, uh, you know, a few decades. Uh, people took, um, you know, a lot of the more interesting, important stuff. And a lot of the stuff that would have been just thrown away 
uh, my dad and I, I carted out here and it forms a lot of our collection. And so we have, you know, records and receipts and boarding passes and, uh, you know, conference name tags and uh, a bit of clothing and, and all these kinds of things and uh, general ephemera. You know, Marshall, Marshall made notes on, on everything, uh, receipts, boarding passes, labels, um, you know, bits of notepaper, coupons in the margins of newspapers, magazines. Um, and they're, uh, they're all part of, of one collection and, and they all have their place and their interest. Um, it's a bit tricky to, to manage them sometimes, uh, but I've, I've tried to collate them together as, as best I can. Um, but that's one of the reasons why um, I love this collection because um, it affords, you know, um, the thing about a physical library as opposed to a digital library uh, is um, browsing, you know, browsing is a very important thing. And uh, I mean, you can browse Wikipedia or you can browse academia or, you know, Google things, um, but it's, it's of a different quality um, than browsing a collection like this. And like I said, um, you know, to be a little mystical about it, I really do feel that Marshall and Eric left their imprint and part of their essence on these things. Um, you know, the act of writing, uh, you don't leave the same kind of imprint on digital things. Uh, that, that soul is missing. So um, I, I'm not, uh, I don't like to be too precious about prioritizing print over screen, over digital. I mean, obviously, uh, as people who have studied communication and the effects of technologies, we know that uh, they have great, greatly different effects, but um, you know, they also have their uses, obviously. Um, you know, we're able to do this today because of uh, the technologies that we have. So, um, but at the same time, I think uh, we lose something if we don't preserve these forms as well, um, because they're good at things that the digital are not and vice versa. So um, yeah, I think, I think there's a lot of value to be had um, in the digital for sure. Um, you can't beat it for speed and for access. Um, as much as I say, you know, I'm open and come visit me. Uh, it's a lot easier to download a PDF or, you know, to look at my inscriptorium blog to see these things that I'm talking about. Not everybody can travel to Ottawa to the archives or to Toronto or wherever. So, um, you know, we, uh, I think it's, it's easy to be a little precious over one form or another. Um, I like to think there's a place uh, for it all. Yeah. I, I, I hope I, you didn't wander too far away from your question, Gisele. Gisele, did you have, um, was that a, an adequate response to <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, uh, yeah, go ahead. Do you have a follow-up? No. Okay. I just can't wait to visit uh, the Institute, Andrew, with the graduate students. You know, I really can't wait to be able to, I don't know if my wife is listening because this is our home now. Uh, <laughs> as I was saying to Baruch, um, uh, I'm speaking from the two-story barn and there's a three-story barn where I have a workshop. I'm actually a furniture upholsterer by trade and I do the McLuhan stuff in my part time. Um, but this was my parents' property. There's an 1870s farmhouse and these outbuildings. And they bought this place in 2005. Um, my wife and I with our two, our two sons, we lived uh, near here in the town called Picton. It's a 10 minute drive. Um, and following uh, my father's death uh, coming up on three years ago, uh, my mom moved uh, into a newer house um, and what was going to happen to this, uh, to all these things was kind of up in the air. Um, really, there was no way we could move all these 6,000 items plus, you know, the memorabilia into our small house in town. Well, not that small, but 
um, really the only thing to do would be to sell our house and to move here. Um, and we tried uh, last fall and the house didn't sell. Um, and then the, we were going to try again this spring. Um, this area, Prince Edward County, is actually a very popular area. Um, it's a, a growing, uh, it's the newest wine region in Ontario. And it's, uh, it attracts a lot of Toronto hipsters for the Drake uh, Hotel and all these kinds of things. A lot of people from Quebec come here for the Sandbanks Beach. Um, so it's not, it's not quite uh, a backwater. Uh, it's, a, it's a cool area. Um, anyway, we decided to list our house again in the spring. And then of course the pandemic hit, but uh, we put it on the market and it sold. Um, I guess people wanted to get out of big cities and move to the country, go figure. Um, and uh, it sold for just enough basically to buy it. So uh, we sold our house and we bought this place. And so now um, I live here and uh, part of the deal with my mom was that um, we bought the property and the content. So this is uh, my library now, which is kind of amazing. And um, I'm, for me, um, I'm all about um, sharing and access. Um, there's no point to me of, of keeping these things uh, behind closed doors and away from people. Uh, personally, um, as a media ecologist, uh, to me, a media ecology entails action if uh, communication entails change. Uh, so does media ecology. And uh, I think we need all the tools we can get in order to uh, bring about that change. Um, and in here are a hell of a lot of tools. So um, I'm very much looking forward to uh, being able to open to the public and, and welcome people here. Um, I'll have to tidy up a little bit, but... Uh, uh, I'm looking forward to seeing you, uh, Jean-Francois, and uh, anybody else. Um, when such things are possible, do send me an email, and uh, we'll get you out here. Yeah, so I, um, coming to the, uh, as we're kind of wrapping up, we have uh, quite a few questions here. So I'm going to try to, um, sorry, I'm getting very large close-ups of my face. Um, uh, we're going to try to con condense some things, but yes, what you were saying about this, this, the browsing and the, and the importance of like being in this, in this space, uh, which was also the workspace where ideas were, were generated. I think it's really, is really pertinent uh, to a, a kind of understanding of, of, of media scholarship, uh, which, you know, to use a trendy word in, 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 uh, in philosophy these days uh, has this aspect of situatedness. Right, and I think it's something that uh, Marshall McLuhan, Marshall uh, was particularly attuned to. That you know, he he never tried to develop a, a um, an objective, you know, a purely rational scientific form of of, of discourse. He was he was always using puns, vernacular, you know, local expressions that 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 always kind of situated his discourse in a, in a place in a in a in a tradition in a in a in the genealogy, right? Yeah, you know, it's, um, what's really interesting is, um, uh, I, as I said, in the fall, I did this course uh, I called UMI, Understanding Media Intensive, and uh, 12 weeks, Saturday afternoons for three hours, um, I led my students uh, through the first seven chapters of Understanding Media. Um, and this library came, came in handy for that because uh, what I did was, um, I sort of, if, if understanding media is kind of a poetic text, uh, I kind of uh, unpacked it very much and I tracked down uh, all the little references, authors, phrases. Uh, one of the things I used was Eric McLuhan has a thing called the Brewer's Dictionary of Phrase and Fable. Um, and if you don't have this, get a copy. It's a wonderful, wonderful reference text. Um, I used it, for example, in uh, the chapter Narcissus Narcosis. Um, in Brewer's Dictionary, um, there's a little explication of the Narcissus myth. And uh, Marshall's take on Narcissus and, and generally used, um, the way Marshall uses it and the way the fable actually runs is that um, Narcissus didn't see himself in the pool he thought he was looking at somebody else. And that runs really contrary to how we 
think of narcissism as being obsessed with ourselves, right? Um, so uh, it all kind of, it's interesting because understanding media, when Marshall was putting all these things into it, they're all from his library. So if you want to come out of the text, you can go into the library to kind of uh, enrich it and make things bigger as well. Um, yeah. Yeah, I want to shout out to uh, to Emma E, who has been commenting uh, uh, very generously in in the YouTube comments, and was saying that the archives and the treasure of the handwriting notes and all those little things the author hasn't mentioned are so valuable. the The archive is an artwork. It's a, certainly a form of of installation, uh, but a concretion, uh, an accumulation. It's, it's so much. Uh, Angela had also some. Uh, a comment on on books and what you were discussing about books. Angela, please. Okay. Yeah, Andrew, thank you very much for this wonderful presentation. Um, and, and it really made me rethink what a book is. A book is not a kind of dead object, but it's a very, very lively entity. And I mean, you showed us all these remarks and the, and the, and the, and the contents of the book and the different materialities. Um, and I think this is a very good experience to to reevaluate what the book is and to be a little bit more careful towards um, um, digital media technologies. And what I think what is very good and what Marshall McLuhan has taught us is that media don't disappear. Mm -hmm. they, they just change or hybrid, hybridize with um, other media. So yeah, thank you very much. I'm very much impressed and I, and I would like to come and to see this wonderful collection. Thank you, Angela. Uh, I appreciate that. Um, there's so much I, I really didn't go into um, because we only have so much time. But um, one of the, the great things is my father died fairly young. He was only 76 years old uh, and rather suddenly too. He died while we were in Colombia. Uh, he was giving a talk. Um, his last speech had ended up, um, and he died the next day in the hotel while we were waiting to to come home, um, which is insane. But um, in the years coming up to that, um, you know, my dad was diabetic and his health had always been a little bit fragile. So I knew he wasn't going to be around forever. And I kept um, bugging him and urging him to leave behind notes, um, you know, tell me things so that when he's gone uh, and I don't have him to turn to for answers, um, I'll have things. And the interesting thing I've found and three, almost three years now is, is more distance. Uh, but, you know, I used to think, oh shoot, he's gone and now I can't ask him any more questions. But uh, again, the wonderful thing about these, this collection here is that he's not gone and he left so many answers. Um, for example, I was telling Baruch earlier, uh, this here is the, the rhetoric shelf. And um, my dad, he, Eric left a note here. You can see it's kind of waffled because it was sitting on top of the, the, uh, the books. And it says, um, you know, this is a, a note to me on style. Dad was a, he was a professional editor. He was a, an incredible writer. Um, I'm, I'm sort of a hack and it says style, basic question. What is the range of experience emotion that this or this idiom can access or express? How deep, subtle, in what areas can you make distinctions or not? Uh, each idiom is a way of knowing, likewise perception, bias, media. Um, just on the shelves, uh, tucked into books, um, in my dad's copy of, of books, you, you learn all kinds of things like, um, uh, okay, so I, I talked about the trilogy of understanding media. Um, this is a companion uh, book to understanding media, understanding poetry um, by uh, Clint Brooks and Robert Penn Warren. Um, these were colleagues of Marshall's at Cambridge uh, and it's inscribed for Eric. Christmas 1961, and Marshall writes, Clint Brooks, a large, long-standing friend of mine, did revolutionize the teaching of literature in the USA with this book. Um, 
and Marshall uh, titled Understanding Media um, to draw attention to understanding poetry and to this lineage following practical criticism uh, with I.A. Richards uh, and the others at, at Cambridge University. Um, so, I mean, there's just, there's so many uh, little tendrils and, and crumbs and specks to lead you along these journeys of understanding. Uh, I've, only, I've only begun to, to scratch the surface and I know, I know enough to know that um, this is only my first spin through it too. When I come back through uh, again, I'll learn even more. So uh, I'm, I'm really, I'm so privileged to have this, uh, this incredible resource. And I can't wait to share it uh, with others. If you're interested in, I only touched a little briefly on my methods. Um, one of the talks I gave at the Fisher Library is up on YouTube as well. Um, I think it's titled The Working Library of Marshall McLuhan. Um, and you can follow along my uh, TMI Live videos on, on YouTube as well uh, for even more. <laughs> okay. Well, um, I guess we should kind of wrap it up, but we have uh, Andrea Bergner, uh, who has uh, Wort Meldung, a, uh, would like to ask a closing question. So maybe Andrea, I give you the, the floor. Thank you, Baruch. Thank you, Andrew. This was wonderful. And I think I, I can just echo that everybody would like to be with you there now, <laughs> just discovering all the books, taking them out and, and find all these annotations ourselves. So it's, it's, it's uh, amazing the insight that we get and that you allowed us to get. And I love, of course, as, as Angela already said, I mean, I love this idea of a book being alive. Uh, I think it's so true. Uh, I'm still, as on, on the other side, as a media, on a media side, I, I'm, I'm wondering, uh, especially in these pandemic times, I mean, you, you offer a few things that how we can access it when we are not able to travel to Canada and to you. Um, so, but, but I'm still wondering, as an archivist, as a researcher, like, what are your plans? How, how will you make it also accessible in other ways? Like, how can we really explore and, and, and also follow these processes that you described so wonderfully, these annotations that shows us the, the working process of, of Marshall and, and also Eric, like, uh, is there any plans or how you will make that accessible. I know accessibility is one of your big uh, um, devotions to make that all accessible. Yes, um, thank you, Andrea. Uh, it's really great to see you again. Um, and I wish you all could be here too. Um, yeah, it is, it is something I'm thinking a lot about. Technology is really coming along. Um, Access uh, is, is the big thing for me uh, because I truly believe who knows where the next, um, uh, you know, genius, the next leaps in thoughts um, that will help us all will come from, you know, it could very well come from uh, India or from Germany or even from, you know, Toronto by somebody who can't even travel out here. Um, so I, I've been, I've thought a lot about how to make things accessible. Um, there are copyright issues as well. And uh, so it's, it's tricky terrain that I haven't completely figured out. Um, that is one of the reasons why I do things like this. And I do um, my uh, weekly broadcast, which I'm going to get back to starting next week. Um, and just putting things out there as much as I can. Um, I would love to digitize uh, a lot of things. Um, make things available like Marshall's speech notes are, are a really incredible resource. These are, are talks that we don't have any other record for, but we have Marshall's comments uh, on his notes. Like for example, one of the coolest ones is um, I have a file with 10 pages on Bilderberg uh, stationery, um, his speech to the Bilderberg group in 1969, which uh, hasn't been heard outside uh, of that place, but here are all Marshall's notes. So we know what he, he told them, uh, which is amazing. And I'd love to make these things available. Um, my uncle Michael, who's the executor of the estate of Marshall McLuhan also believes in getting the work out there. So um, I'm really grateful for his support and we'll figure out a way to make things uh, more accessible 
um, in the future. Uh, if there's you know tech people out there, especially somebody who'd like to sponsor digitization, um, I'd love to hear from you. I have boxes of reel-to-reel -reel recordings of uh, Center for Culture and Technology Monday night seminars and classes and who knows what else is on there. Um, but as you can imagine, uh, as anybody in, in the fields know, um, it takes budgets to be able to make things available. And uh, I have no budget, really. Like I said, this is my spare time kind of thing. So I'm um, always looking for ways to, to attract that kind of uh, funding. Um, I'd like to say thank you again to Tina, uh, to Baruch, um, to the Museum for Communication in Frankfurt uh, for uh, allowing me to, to talk to you all today. And thank you for being here and your questions uh, and your interest. Uh, I appreciate it very much. Thank you. Thanks so much for your generous uh, time and your generous answers. You're getting applause <laughs> from, the, <laughs> from everybody. Thank you everybody for coming uh, also on YouTube uh, for your also your generous comments and questions. And uh, we'll be ending the stream now. Um, everybody who's uh, in the chat, please hang around for a little bit and uh, uh, we can just have a little conversation. This is like, just like being at the museum after the talk, uh, a little bit of informal talk uh, for everybody on YouTube. Uh, thank you so much for tuning in. Please do follow the McLuhan Institute live on YouTube. Uh, I'm very excited to hear that. <laughs> They're coming back with some new episodes, but there's a lot of amazing stuff on there. I think there's got to be at least 50 episodes already uh, on there. And there's also a lot of interesting stuff on the McLuhan Institute YouTube channel and on that uh, scriptorium um, uh, blog, which, uh, which Andrew mentioned. So um, keep uh, in also, touch. Also, uh, mm -hmm. follow, you can follow the McLuhan Institute on Twitter and on Instagram um, and on Facebook. Um, as I'm going along, I post quotes and things that you might not otherwise come across on Twitter and a lot of photographs documenting the visual journey in here uh, on Instagram. So check that stuff out too. Fantastic. Okay, so we're going to end the stream now. Thank you all for being here and see you next time. Come to the museum when it opens again. <laughs> we have, oh yeah, we have good news. Uh, it's going to be extended to June, the exhibition, right, Tina? So, are you, yes, yes, it's agreed. So it's going to be extended to June. June, there's still more time to see the exhibition in Frankfurt. Please come and check us out. Good night or good afternoon. Have a great day, everybody. <laughs>